morning, church. This morning we get to read Joshua 3, 1 through 17. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, commanded the priests, as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one or from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and in the feet and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its banks through the time of the harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zareth, Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. You guys doing well? Outstanding. Good to have you with us. Welcome to Desert Breeze Community Church. Also want to welcome those of you that are on YouTube Live right now and those that will be watching throughout the week. Good to have you with us. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Joshua chapter 3. We're actually looking at verse, uh, chapters 3 and 4. I'll just talk a little bit about 4. You can read that on your own. I'm loving this teaching series through Joshua. How about you? It's been a fantastic series. We're right in the, not so much in the middle of it, but we're about three into this series. Joshua Advanced Tactics in Spiritual Warfare. You need these for our hostile world that we live in if you're going to survive. Moving Ahead by Faith is the title of this weekend's message. Grab your sermon notes out. You can follow along. Let me bring you up to speed. Fullness of life in Christ is to us what the promised land was to Israel to be entered into against the assaults of the enemy as we claim our inheritance. The the word inheritance is used 58 times in Joshua. The idea behind Joshua is this. Don't be content with a wilderness experience when Christ offers us so much more. You guys know this. There was a whole generation that died wandering around in the wilderness. How long should it have taken them to go from Egypt into the promised land? Anybody? Probably about two weeks, maybe 14 days at the most, they found themselves wandering around in the wilderness because of unbelief, because of the bitterness over the past, complaining about the present, worry about the future. They were not 
putting their faith in God and moving ahead by faith. And you don't want to spend your life wandering around in the wilderness because Christ offers us so much more. That's really the idea behind the book of Joshua. But you've got to learn these advanced tactics in spiritual warfare. Now, take a look at your sermon notes here. Part of the intro that will set you up for this uh, weekend study through chapters 3 and 4, there is no standing still in the Christian life. You guys agree with that? Okay, not, not enough of you agree with that, okay? Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, you better. There is no standing still in the Christian life. We are either moving ahead by faith or going back in unbelief. Now, what's crazy is they were wandering around in the wilderness, headed to the promised land. There are times that they said, we wish we were back in Egypt under slavery. That doesn't make sense. You guys are delusional. Anytime you want to go back rather than go forward, the enemy is working you pretty hard. And I gave you one of those instances there in Numbers 14, 1 through 4 in your notes. Now, moving ahead by faith is about turning, is, is learning to put off the old self and put on the new self in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. I'll, I'll explain that in just a moment. It's on your notes. So putting off the old self and putting on the new self is to us what crossing the Jordan River and entering into the promised land was for the Israelites. So, okay, pop quiz time. Put your Bibles under your seat. Okay, no, don't do that. But uh, So let me just see how well you remember the first week when I talk, talked about the typology that we see. It's called really scriptural typology. Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. He says, these things are an example for our instruction. So when we look back in Egypt, the nation of Israel in bondage in Egypt, what does that represent to us in scriptural typology? Anybody? Anybody? Slavery to sin, it's our life before Christ, to where we are enslaved by sin. Slavery to sin. Okay, you missed the first one. Okay, let's give you the second one here. Okay, so let's see if you can get the second one. So what does the Passover represent? Remember, while they were in Egyptian bondage, they, they, they instituted the first time the Passover. Remember, they put blood. So, so what does that mean? Sacrifice of Christ, yeah, in fact, it's, it's their salvation. It's a picture of our salvation through Jesus Christ. The blood over the doorpost, kind of made in the, in the way of a cross, really, if you looked at it. So that's fascinating. Okay, uh, I think you did a little better on that one. Some of you missed those first two, okay? Just telling you, and I might have to hold you after class and uh, kind of talk to you about these things. Okay, here's the third one, crossing the Red Sea. What does that represent? What kind of scriptural typology is that, crossing the Red Sea? So keep in mind, slavery to sin, salvation, crossing the Red Sea is baptism. Baptism. Anybody think baptism? Okay, couple, couple of you here, okay. How about over here? You guys need to get with it. Okay, I'm just kidding. Okay, so it, it's, it's baptism, water baptism. Okay, the wilderness wanderings is what? It's early experiences as Christians, our struggles with, with our hurts and habits and hang-ups, our, our struggles with sin, our struggles with the sin that's been committed against us. How do we work through that? Well, we got to cross the Jordan River. That's putting off the old self and putting on the new self. And then the promised land is the spirit-filled life for the fullness of life Christ came to give to us. Now, I wanted you to understand this. There's plenty of room in the notes, and as you know me, I like to pack the notes with a lot of info so that you can take it with you and study it throughout the week. But I'm, I'm explaining this to you, this putting off the old self and putting on the new self. Listen to me. If you're not learning how to put off the old self, put on the new self, you're not going to enter into the fullness of life that Christ offers you. You're not moving ahead by faith. This is serious stuff. You need to know this. You should be practicing this in your life. 
And so the next few weeks, we're going to be talking more about what does that look like in our life, but I've got it right here on your notes. So Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, you must no longer walk as the unbelievers do. So that's verse 17 in Ephesians 4. You can study that on your own. That's just a summary statement. He goes into detail about how unbelievers live their life, and our lives should be in stark contrast to unbelievers. I mean, we have the living God in our lives. So that just makes sense. And then he talks about what that looks like, putting off the old self, that's verse 22, which means to stop looking to anything other than God for your deepest satisfaction or your identity. So, so you stop looking to created things, your family, your job, your health, any number of things for your sense of identity, your security, your significance, your satisfaction, your meaning, hope, and happiness in life. You stop doing that. And then you put off, you, you uh, putting on the new self, that's verse 24, means to make God your ultimate object of worship because he is your most satisfying reality. He becomes your identity. So you're not working for your identity, but you're working from your identity in Christ, your completeness in him. And, and there's a verse that goes between, you know, obviously you can see that's verse 22 and 24. Because verse 23, it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So if you're going to put off the old, you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind so that you can put on the new and enter into all that God has for us in Christ Jesus. What does that mean, the renewing of your mind? It means living for God's glory, motivated by God's love, according to God's word. So, so the Christian life, the gospel is not a morally restrained will motivated by fear and pride. It's a supernaturally transformed heart for the glory of God motivated by the love of God according to God's word. Major difference between the two. So your heart is being transformed by God's grace and by the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and, and let me just say... I'm going to save you a couple hundred dollars in counseling right here, okay, in this next thing. Actually, you might still need to go to counseling to work some of these details down deep into your heart. But, but if you could start learning this, oh my goodness, it's going to change your life. This is how change happens where we enter into all that God has for us. Look at the next uh, point, and, and this is what you need to learn to do. Pay attention to your uncontrollable and inconsolable negative thoughts and feelings and you'll discover hanging from the roots of them are your counterfeit gods, your idols. So, so idols are, are those things that, we're, uh, that we love more than Christ. We're trying to get our sense of identity out of more than Christ. We're living for our idols. And it can be good things that have become ultimate things in our life. It can be a marriage. It can be your kids, how they turn out, how they do. It can be your bank account, your career, any number of things. But when those things, those created things, those temporal things are threatened, blocked, or lost, you're going to have an inordinate anxiety. You're going to have uh, anxiety, anger, and depression overwhelm you because that which is most important to you is being threatened, blocked, or maybe lost, which is going to create the depression. And so when you, when you uh, pay attention to your uncontrollable and inconsolable negative thoughts and feelings you'll discover hanging from the roots of them are your counterfeit gods, are your idols. So here's where life change happens. Life change happens when you identify your idols, those things that have captured your heart's deepest loyalties and affections. You identify your idols and look to Christ to meet your need or needs that you're trying to, to get met through your idol. So let's stand for closing prayer because that's all you need right there, okay? Now, actually, the rest of this message is going to walk us through in the next few weeks. We'll be, in fact, the rest of the Joshua series is really all about how do you put off the old, put on the new, being renewed in your mind so that you can enter into all that Christ has for you, which is an exceptional life. It's life to its fullest. There's no other life that you can find on planet Earth that even compares to the life that He offers us. And so that's my intro. That's it. I finished. I made it. Okay. Woo! Praise God.
Praise God. So now we've, we're going to pray, and then we're going to dive into this text and unpack uh, the notes here. But just take a moment. Would you bow your heads with me? Take a deep breath. Inhale. Exhale. Set aside anything that's distracting you here this morning. God wants to meet with you. He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to speak to your heart. Just take a moment. Father God, thank you for giving us the greatest gift imaginable, salvation through Jesus Christ. May we not be content with a wilderness experience when when Christ Jesus offers us so much more. Help us to see that there is no standing still in the Christian life. We are either moving ahead by faith or going back in unbelief. Lord, we want to learn how to move ahead by faith. Teach us that. I pray that those that aren't, may they be convicted this morning to start moving ahead by faith. Those that are moving ahead by faith, may they be comforted. May they be encouraged. And may this morning, as we study your word, may Christ become more beautiful to our imagination and more desirable to our hearts than anything else in this world, we pray in his beautiful name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. So moving ahead by faith. So what does that look like? He spells it out here for us. Let God's presence lead you. That's your first fill in the blank. Let God's presence lead you. Look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 3. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, and he and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. They're getting ready to pass over the Jordan River into the promised land. And at the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Okay, here's a question for you. You can answer this out loud. What's the greatest thing God has ever done for us? The greatest thing God has ever done for us? Anybody? Salvation. Yeah, salvation through Jesus Christ. Yeah, He has reconciled us to Himself by sending His Son to die in our place for our sins, and all who repent and believe in Him have everlasting life. Whoa! I've never gotten over that. I'm reconciled to God once and for all through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, so here's my second question. What's the greatest thing God has ever given to us? That's the greatest thing He's ever done for us. Good, you got it. Yeah, it's Himself. It's Himself. Try not to be so vocal next time. I'm just kidding you. Great job. That's exactly it. He's given, now think about this. He's given us Himself. So He's reconciled us to Himself the best thing he's ever done for us, and the greatest thing he's ever given to you, you have God. You can have an intimate relationship with the eternal God. That in itself should set you apart from anybody else, that you know the true and living God. That is amazing. Oh, my goodness. And and, and really what he's talking about here is, is that very thing. The people were to cross the Jordan River by following the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is the manifested presence of God. So through their sacrificial system represents the, their being reconciled to God, and now the Ark of the Covenant is the manifested presence of God. And in fact, it is mentioned, the, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is mentioned 16 times in chapters 3 and 4. So it's a, it's a big deal. This is the very presence of God with them. So So how important is God's presence uh, to their lives? How important is God's presence to our lives? It's extremely important, isn't it? So so if you go back to Moses, Moses handed the baton off to Joshua, and Joshua is now leading the people into the promised land. And so this is really important, but go back to Joshua as they're wandering around, back to Moses as they're wandering around in the wilderness. There's an event that happened when Moses comes down off of the hill, off the, not a hill, the mountain, interacting with God, bringing the Ten Commandments, and, and the people are worshiping a golden calf. You guys remember that incident? It's horrible. It's bad. And so God takes it, or Moses takes it to God, and God says, okay, I'm, I'm pretty much done with the people, and I'm going to give you what I promised you, 
I'm going to go ahead and let you go into the promised land. I'm going to send an angel, and the angel is going to lead you into the promised land. But if I go with you, I will probably destroy the people because, yes, I'm that holy, and you guys are that sinful. In fact, he calls them, you are stiff-necked people. And so it's, it's a fascinating story, and so Moses really intercedes for the people, and this is what Moses says, just to show you the importance of God's presence, and he's saying, you're not going to go with us? What's going to set us apart from everybody else? We need your presence. In fact, this is what he says. We would rather wander around in the wilderness the rest of our lives with your presence than to go into the promised land, the land of milk and honey, without your presence. Do you hear what he's saying? <laughs> Does that make his presence pretty powerful, pretty significant? I put it in my notes here. The worst day with your presence is better by far than the best day without your presence. You can have the promised land. We want you more than anything, if, even if we have to wander around in the wilderness. Whoa! Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Psalm 8410. Remember the psalmist said, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Do you believe the same thing that they're saying in the Scripture? Do you understand the significance of God's presence in our life? That we have Him leading, guiding, directing? This is what He's starting off with. If you want to put off the old self, put on the new self, entering in, into the fullness of life that Christ offers us, we've got to let God's presence lead us. Intimacy with God is life's most satisfying reality. I'm convinced of that. And, and, and that would be normal Christianity. Intimacy with God is life's most satisfying reality. Nothing more satisfying than having this relationship with Him. So, if you're going to move ahead by faith, you must let God's presence lead you. How? I think you can go back to the first two chapters. Quick review here. So, how do I know that I'm being led by God's presence? First chapter, we talked about the secrets of success. There were three. This were... Uh, this was really what we called the answers to the test. And uh, if they're going to really not just survive, but thrive and shine for God in a hostile world, you need to know the comfort of His presence. That was the first one. That was chapter one. And you need to cultivate this intimacy with God where He's speaking to your heart. You know He's speaking to you and He's leading you. But you also do that based on the counsel of His Word and then the community of God's people. So you need those three. That would be kind of three, kind of a checklist of identifying when and how God is speaking to you, if indeed He is. By the way, in that first uh, message, I also talked about, since we're heading into a general election, I talked about how to vote from a biblical worldview. If you were not here and didn't listen to that message, I would encourage you to go online and listen to it. You can get it on YouTube or you can go to our website and get that. But that would be the first way that we re really know that God is leading us. The comfort of God's presence, so you need to have meaningful conversation with Him regularly where you get a sense of Him speaking to your heart, to your mind, to your life. You filter it through God's Word, and then you have the community of God's people that kind of help you with that. They, they encourage you in that. The second one was Joshua chapter 2. You need to make sure you, that you have true life-changing faith. What did we study last week? Who was the person that had life-changing faith? Anybody? Rahab. Phenomenal story. Rahab the prostitute had an encounter with the living God. And so, uh, you need to have an encounter with the living God. Life-changing faith, Rahab. Faith is not a feeling, a force, or a formula. What is it? It's fellowship, friendship with God. It's undeserved friendship, fellowship with God. And so it involves, as we said last week, and the mind is instructed. So there's things that you need to know about God. Your mind is instructed. And then the emotions are stirred and the will acts in obedience to God. You need to have all three of those. That's life-changing faith. So that's how we really learn to let God's presence lead us. Let God take the lead. God was to be way out in front of them. And God, and you've heard me say this, I'm going to say it again, God has a better plan for your life than you do for your life. Get rid of your plan, take on His plan. Makes, let Him call the shots for you. Let Him lead the way. Make sure that God is leading you in your singleness 
or in your married life, or in your relationships, or in your career, in your parenting, in your finances, in how you spend your time, how you live your life, how you take care of your body. Let him lead the way. Don't run ahead of God's presence. This is the idea that he's talking about here. So you need to cultivate intimacy with him and allow him to lead you. When we run ahead of God's presence, we are saying, I know better than God. It is the sin beneath every sin. So it is human nature to rush into things. We all tend to do that. And so many people act first and then pray later. I see that happen all the time. And then they get themselves into trouble, and then they blame God. And I'm thinking, hey, did you pray about this? Did you seek God's guidance? Did you let him lead you? Oh, no, I really didn't. Okay, well, that's probably why you might be facing some of the consequences. Proverbs 19, 2 through 3, it says, Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses the way. When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. I find a lot of people angry at God, and I'm thinking, hey, did, do you have an intimate relationship with God, and did he lead you in that direction, or you just, did you just run and gun and just do your own thing, and now you're going to blame him for it? That's crazy. He goes on in verse 4, he says, yet there shall be a distance between you and it. Do not come near it. He's talking about the covenant of the Lord. He's talking about this, uh, the covenant, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. So basically, he's just saying, don't run ahead of God's presence. Don't lag too far behind. Don't get too close to the ark because it's sacred. In other words, he's just saying, hey, don't treat the presence of God carelessly or in a cavalier way. So when we come in to worship, we don't, you know, we don't take it for granted. We can encounter God. So you take that seriously is what he's saying here. And so what we learn from this first point is that God will lead you where his presence will comfort you, his word will counsel you, and his people will encourage you. That's all part of that. So that's the first thing. If you're going to put off the old, put on the new, enter into all that God has for you, you have got to let his presence lead you. Let God's presence lead you. Here's another important part. Uh, consecrate yourself. That's your next fill in the blank. That's verses 5 through 7. Consecrate yourself. So in verse 5, then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves. Now check this out. It's interesting as he says, consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So it seems to be tied to us consecrating ourselves. So it's important to kind of understand what it means to consecrate ourselves or sanctify yourselves. G. Campbell Morgan said this, the church pure is the church powerful. Maybe you're familiar with the uh, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall what? They shall see God. They shall see God. So there's things that create an impurity in our lives that keep us from seeing God and experiencing God in our life, those things we need to remove from our life. So what does that mean? A consecrated life or a holy life is a life holy, holy devoted to God, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy. I give my whole life to God. Romans 12, 1, this is what Paul is saying. He spent 11 chapters talking about all that Christ is and all that he's done for us. He's talking about the deep affection that God has for us, and he says, I appeal to you, brothers, in light of God's mercy, because of God's mercy, to give your bodies, your lives as a living sacrifice to God. Live your life wholly devoted to Him. He just says that's just normal response. After all He's done for us, we want to live our lives for Him. We want to live for His glory, motivated by God's love according to God's Word, as, as we already said. That's, that's a, holy, a holy life. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16, this is God speaking to us. He says, be holy because I am holy. God is contending, in saying these words, he's contending for our completeness, our wholeness, our greatness. Now, this is what you need to keep in mind, is that we, there is a positional 
holiness and then there's a practical holiness. Anybody here by show of hands know what I'm talking about when I say positional holiness and practical? Not very many of you know this, so I'll try not to confuse you in explaining it to you, okay? So the, uh, the positional holiness happens the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ because he got our record and our performance laid on him on the cross. He died for our sins and then we received his what is called an imputed righteousness. So we put our faith in Christ, that's how God sees us. He sees us as blameless and holy in his sight. But practically, we're a long ways from that. So that's positionally. But practically, we, as we begin to live our life, we want our lives practically to, to look how we are positionally before God. You guys tracking with me? Does that make sense? And so, so, therefore, we don't consecrate ourselves to somehow be right with God. We consecrate ourselves because we are already right with God through the finished work of Christ on the cross. That makes sense? Okay. Four of us got it. Good. Okay. I think more of you got it. I see you nod in your heads, but you got to get that. So I'm not trying to earn right standing with God. I have right standing with God through Jesus Christ. But practically, I still struggle with sin. Anybody here still struggle with sin? Okay, just everybody raise your hand. Some of you need to raise both hands, okay? <laughs> and we all do. Come on. You're out of touch if you don't. If you don't realize that, we all struggle. If you th if anyone who thinks they're without sin, they deceive themselves and the truth is not in you, okay? It says that in 1 John chapter 1, okay? It talks about us, the importance of confessing our sins. And so what we're doing here, having, being in right standing with God... I'm wanting to deal with anything that's interfering with my relationship with him. So this idea of consecrating, it, 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 it is not the drudgery. It's not the drudgery of self-denial, but the delight of living fascinated in the superior pleasures of God's love for me and my love for him and others. It's an exceptional life. It's an incredible life. It's an amazing life. It's fullness of life in Christ Jesus, and no one has ever given their whole life to God and then regretted it, okay? I'm just telling you. And so you gave your life to God once and for all, but then you got to continue to do that every day as you walk out this practical righteousness. And so this involves this consecrating life a consecrated life is allowing the Holy Spirit to search your heart. I allow him to search my heart daily when I spend time with him so that I can confess and repent of sin. I mean, verses like Psalm 139, 23, and 24, this is what you should be doing regularly. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let him speak to your heart. And so what I typically do at those times, I look at my motives. What have my motives been over the last 24 hours, 48 hours? My motives, my thoughts, my words, my actions. Are they loving? Because I think the, the, measure, of, the measure of maturity is love. Lord, am I becoming more loving? It says that in 1 John 4, 7, and 8. In fact, it says that if you don't have love, you're not born again or you don't know God, one or the other. You may be born again, but you're not really knowing God because God is love. You're going to become a more loving person. And so the way you become a more loving person is that your love for God and others grows in direct proportion to your experience of his love for you. And the only way that you're not experiencing his love is that there's other things that have gotten in the way of his love for you. Your deepest, your heart's deepest loyalties and affections are being taken away from him and him alone. So you're asking God, are those things in my life that are competing for my heart's deepest loyalties and affections away from you? That's what he's saying, consecrate yourself because I'm gonna do wonders in your life. Get, away, get rid of those things that are interfering with your love and devotion to me. And so that's, that's part of it. So you want to look at your motives, thoughts, words, and deeds. And sometimes God will convict me and say, wow, those words, those thoughts, what you did wasn't consistent with how I created you and what I paid for on the cross. So I confess, I repent, come back to him. And very, very similar to what David did, David defeated Goliath but lost, but lost to Bathsheba. 
Our real giants are the desires we haven't killed yet in our heart. Desires that lead us away from this intimate relationship with God. Desires for things that are created as opposed to the Creator. Those things competing for our heart's deepest loyalties away from Christ. That's why David says in his repentance psalm, remember he committed adultery and then murder, he's confronted by the prophet Nathan, and then so he writes Psalm 32, 51, and Psalm 51, 10, he says, create in me a clean heart, an undivided heart. Lord, I want you to have my heart's deepest loyalties and affections. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Give me a persevering spirit all the way to the end until I see you. So the sign that you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and you're learning to consecrate your heart is not that you have no bad desires, but that you are at war with them. You're going to have bad desires, but you're at war with those desires. That's why it says in Galatians 5.16, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So this goes all the way back. This is, this is putting off the old self, putting on the new self. So what we're doing here, it's the superior pleasures in Christ that overcome the inferior pleasures of sin. The reason why you're unable to say no, as he says here, to the desires of the flesh and you want to gratify the desires of the flesh because you actually think you're going to be happier by pursuing the things of the flesh as opposed to pursuing the things of the Spirit. So the power of sin's promise of happiness is always broken by the power of God's promise of happiness through His Son, Jesus Christ. So that's what he says here. It's, it's walk by the Spirit. Oh my goodness, when you understand, and we're, we're talking entering into the promised land. We're talking fullness of life in Christ. That's walking in the Spirit. And when you walk in the Spirit, you find your deepest satisfaction in Christ, you're going to overcome the desires of the flesh. So spiritually bored people are easily deceived by the pleasures of sin and disillusioned by the pain of suffering. So the goal of consecration is being so happy in God, so contented in God, um, so satisfied in God that sin loses its deceptive appeal and suffering loses its delusional effect on our lives. We're not taken out by sin and suffering. Okay, how? Here's the next one. By focusing on the Lord's greatness and His promises, His goodness. So you can see how these are really kind of sequentially work through our lives. One is built on the other. So we need to be led by the presence of God, and in doing that, naturally, you're going to consecrate yourself. You're going to deal with those competing loyalties and affections that are trying to work against you, pulling your heart away from Christ, Him alone, at the center of your life. And the way you do this is focus on the Lord's greatness and His promises, His goodness. So listen to what he says here. Look at verse 8. This goes from verse 8 to verse 10. And as for you, command the priest to bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you still shall stand still in the water. That's important to keep in mind. We'll talk about that in the next point. But verse 9, this is a bit of a locker room talk. They're getting ready to cross over the Jordan. It's going to be a bit treacherous here. And so he's telling them what they need to focus on. And, and how to do this. And so he's given them kind of a locker room talk. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord. So these are the very words of the Lord. I'm speaking to you, the Lord Yahweh, your God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you. He is powerful. He's alive. He's working. And that he will without fail drive out from before you, the Canaanites and the Hittites, and he goes through the whole list of people that are in the land that they're going to rid the land of. It goes back to Rahab, who I talked about, if you're gonna have faith, you need to have a balanced perspective of God. If you have a healthy faith, you'll have a balanced perspective of God. So he's actually talking here about God as both powerful, but he's also personal. 
So there's as, that aspect of God that he's just, he's righteous, he's holy. But I, I oftentimes see people gravitate more towards that as opposed to there's another aspect of God that he's personal, he's, he's loving and he's gracious and he's merciful. So our tendency is to swing to one extreme or the other, but you need to maintain both of those. He's powerful and yet he's personal. He's indescribably great, but he's unimaginably good. Now why, why would you need to have both of those in balance? Because it's his greatness that makes his goodness so comforting. It's his greatness that makes his goodness so comforting. He says that he's gonna take care of you, but if he doesn't have the capacity to take care of you, that he's a weak, impotent God, then you should be not too confident about him taking care of you. But I'm telling you, the God of the galaxies who created the heavens and the earth said that I'm gonna take care of you, then that should give you courage. So the reason why you don't have courage and by the way, the more you understand his greatness and his goodness, the more it comforts you, giving you courage, eliminating fear in your life. That's why you need to have that balanced, balanced perspective. He's incredibly great, unimaginably good. And he says, I'm going to take care of you. And so it's his greatness that makes his goodness so comforting. But it's his goodness that makes his greatness so convicting. It humbles me and eliminates pride. So a, a healthy psychology in somebody who has a relationship with God would be certainly a courage with humility, a humble confidence, as you've heard me say before, or a humble courage. And I, I love, uh, we, we did a whole teaching on Psalm 8, it was about our identity in Christ here this last summer. And uh, Psalm 8, 3 and 4, David says it's almost like he's walking out on a starry night and he's, he's reflecting on the greatness of God and the goodness of God. And he says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers and the stars and the moon, how you have set them in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You hear what's going on in, in David's heart? He's basically saying, I am a speck of dust in the vastness of the universe, and yet I fill your mind and your heart, God. That amazes me. Amen. That should just overwhelm you, that we can have that relationship. So focus on the Lord's greatness and his promises, his goodness. I was talking uh, a couple weeks ago, I talked about it a little bit last weekend, recently waking up in the morning and, and even heading into our week, weekends. Weekends are work, work weeks for me, part of my work week. And I noticed that I was stressed and anxious. I was feeling stressed and anxious. The Lord spoke to me so clearly. I realized that, that my focus and preoccupation was at the center of my life was on what I'm doing or needing to do for God rather than what God has already done and is doing for me through Christ Jesus. So, so even right now, even in your life, everyday life, you're either focusing on what you must do for him or you're focused on what he has done for you. And your preoccupation should be on what he's done for you. And then out of that comes how you should live differently as a result of that. And so um, nothing will ground your identity more deeply, affect your mood more frequently arouse your passion for God more significantly than focusing on what he has done and is doing for you. That should be the preoccupation of your life. So to correct your focus, you need to be with God before you do for God. You need to be before you do. Go ahead and wake up that person sitting next to you and um, if, if I'm, I'm kidding, of course. You guys look like you're all awake, maybe except for a couple of you. But go ahead, uh, Brittany, go ahead and wake up, Jace. Okay. Tell him, Brittany, tell him, be before you do. Say it just like that. Be before you Go ahead and turn to the person next to you and say, you need to be before you do. Okay. And some of you are kind of like pointing your finger at them, kind of lecturing them. Maybe you probably shouldn't do that, but you're just like, come on, be, be with Christ before you do for Christ. 
Be with Christ before you do for Christ. That's important to keep in mind. Too many Christians are chronically overextended in doing more for Jesus than their inner life with Him can sustain. The reason why you get stressed out and overwhelmed is because you're doing more than being. That's, they're heading into the promised land. They're going to cross the Jordan River, and he's saying, hey, focus. Focus on how great God is and how good God is. Doing for Jesus flows out of your being with Jesus. If you practice being before doing, you will operate from a place of emotional and spiritual wealth. What you do is important, but what you are is even more important. And the reason for that is that you can't give what you don't have. A deep inner life with God produces an active, productive life in this world for God. And that would be the difference in your life. So that takes you to the next point. Walk by faith and not by sight. So this is what your life is going to look like. If you are being before you do, you're going to learn to walk by faith, not by sight. Your life is going to have an impact in other people's lives. It's going to have an overflow into other people's lives. Verse 8, you'll notice what he says. As the priest bear the Ark of the Covenant, they're going to come to the waters, and they actually have to get their feet wet. They're going to have to walk out into the water. And I'm thinking if I was bearing the Ark of the Covenant, I'd want to be on the back side rather than the front side. Okay, I'm just thinking, just thinking. I'm, I won't push it too far there. We won't, we'll see how, how far we need to get before he, he opens a way for us to go. But, that's, but they're actually having to get their feet wet. We see that in verse 8. We also see that in verse 13. You shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. We also know based on verse 15, it actually in parentheses it says, now the Jordan overflows all of its banks throughout the time of harvest. So it's April, it's harvest time in the promised land. The snow on Mount Hermon melts and the Jordan River begins to flood and it makes it extremely hard to cross the river during this time of the year. And they're to get out in it and get their feet wet. So God, God could have rolled the water back in advance to their coming, but he doesn't. I wonder why. God is wanting them to walk by faith and not by sight. That's why. God is wanting them to trust his promises. He said, I'm going to get you across, and we're going to conquer the land. I'm going to do that for you. So he's wanting them to trust his promises more than their perceptions. God wants you to trust what he says over what you see. So when they stop out into the water by faith, what happens? Look at verse 16. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away, about 16 miles north from where they are in a city by the name of Adam. Do you find that humorous? Adam? Or Adam, uh, but a dam. So it's, it's interesting. So the water is just piled up and he makes a way. So here's, here's what I think we can learn from this. Your peace is not to be found in figuring your life out, but trusting the one who has, has it all figured out for your good and his glory. Now, God didn't remove the Jordan River. He made a way through it. So think about the obstacles you're facing. He's going to do one of two things. He can remove it or he's gonna make a way through it. But either way, you can trust his perfect love, infinite wisdom, and, and unlimited power working for your good and his glory. That's what he, he's wanting us to learn to walk by faith, not by sight. God, it's in your hands, I'm trusting you, you're gonna make a way for me, or you're gonna, whatever it might be, I'm gonna trust you with this. Can you imagine what the priests carrying the ark and the people following them experienced because they chose to walk by faith and not by sight? I mean, put yourself in their place just for a moment. There's about three million of them crossing the Jordan River, and God works this miracle. And, and as they miraculously crossed the Jordan River, they finally made it home into the promised land. They, they arrived, no more wandering around in the wilderness. Now they got 
you know, they, they've got to clean house. They've got to do some fighting and take ownership of the land. But man, they finally arrived. And I think there's another principle here that I think we can all learn. All of us are called to be priests, carrying the presence of God and leading others into all that God has for them in Christ Jesus. So, Old Testament typology, you've got the temple where you have the presence of God, you have priests, and then you have their sacrifices. So, Jesus, under the new covenant, he became the ultimate priest, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate temple of God, the very presence of God. When we put our faith in God, we become, we become priests, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit, first and foremost. We know that based on 1 Corinthians 3.16. So, when we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. He actually says that in 3.16, 1 Corinthians, you are the temple of God, so the presence of God and our lives are to be a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1, and we are to be priests. It tells us in 1 Peter 2, 9, we are a royal priesthood. So think about that. So God has called us, like these priests, to make a way into the promised land for other people to experience the fullness of God. That's what he's called us to do. There is not a more exciting adventure in life than to be a part of of the miraculous work of God to help a child, a student, an adult to encounter God and to help them experience all that God has for them in Christ Jesus. Absolutely not a better experience than to do that. And God has called us to all do that. If you want to see God work miracles in and through your life, you must step out in faith. You must get your feet wet. You've got to take some risks whether it be with your neighbors or your family and friends. When someone says, hey, I'm struggling in this, you might want to step out, get your feet wet, and say, hey, can I pray for you? I think God can work a miracle in your life. God can use you wherever you are. But you, he can also use you, and he does, many of you that are involved in ministry here. You guys know what I'm talking about. That God would use you to help a child, a youth, an adult, to encounter the living God enter into the promised land that all that God has for them in Christ Jesus. But you got to get your feet wet. So when was the last time you undeniably saw God at work in you or through you or around you? If you're having trouble recounting a time, it may be time to get your feet wet. It might be time to say, okay, okay, I'm letting the Holy Spirit lead me. I've consecrated myself. And what was the the third one? I'm focusing on the Lord's greatness and goodness, but now i got to walk by faith and not by sight. God, I know that you want to use me to make an impact in other people's lives. That's what God's called us to do. If you want to experience more of his power and presence in your life, get involved So why get your feet wet? It's the only way to real growth. This is the way that you move ahead in faith. It's the way true faith develops. It's the alternative to boredom and stagnation that causes people to wither up and die, to go back in unbelief. It is part of discovering and obeying your calling as a fully devoted follower of Christ. Now, most of you know this. I teach this in the DB Life. We talk about it a lot here, that we have a 5G process of moving ahead by faith. It goes right along with what we're talking about here this morning. What's the first G in that G process of full devotion to Christ? What's the first G, anybody? Genuine Christian, someone who's a genuine Christian. That's that very first thing. This is uh, let God's presence lead you, genuine Christian. That's the first G. Second G, what's the second G? Growing Christian. So if you're genuine, and you're letting God's presence lead you, you're gonna wanna live God's word growing as you're gonna consecrate yourself and focus on the Lord's greatness and goodness. You're gonna wanna move ahead by faith. What's the third G? So you got genuine growing, giving, yeah. So you want that to be an overflow in your life. You want to be a giving Christian. This is someone who's walking by faith and not by sight. You wanna contribute to God's work, that's giving, and you wanna make an impact in the world. The fourth G is going, and the fifth G, all for God's glory, is actually the next last two fill-in-the-blanks. 
It's all for God's glory. All for God's glory. So walk by faith and not by sight. Contribute to God's work. Make an impact in this world. I said all that is that you need to know this, that we have no shortage of opportunities for you to connect in a group and serve on a team. That's why we're doing, uh, we've got tables in the foyer. Go check out one of those tables of where you can get plugged in if you're not currently plugged in and involved in ministry. There's opportunity for you to do that. And uh, so memorialize and share with others the great acts of God in your life. This is that fifth G, so genuine growing, giving, going, all for God's glory. This is fullness of life. This is how you move on, move ahead by faith. And I'm just gonna tell you just a little bit because we're almost done. I'll just tell you what this last chapter is about. You can read it on your own. So this is what uh, Joshua tells the people as they're crossing the Jordan River. He says, take 12 stones out of the river, pile them on the east side of the river, on the other side of the river, as a memorial of what I'm doing. Now, why, why would he do that? Why would he do that? Because our sinful human tendency is to forget what God has done for us, especially when everything is going right. So basically, he's just saying, don't ever forget the faithfulness of God. That's what he's saying. This is why he's telling them to do that. So the way that I don't forget the faithfulness of God is I've mem uh, memorialized it and I share it with others, the great acts of God in my life and through my life in the lives of others. I'm regularly sharing that with others. And we all, all need to do that. Don't forget the faithfulness of God. The word remember occurs 16 times in the book of Deuteronomy before they head into Joshua where they take on and head into the promised land. He keeps saying over and over, remember, remember what I've done for you because we, we tend to forget. In remembering God's faithfulness, it will help you to get through life's next big challenge. When you forget his faithfulness, you will fear the present challenges. Faith builds upon faith. So here it is. Do you remember when you first encountered God? When was the last time you shared that with someone? You need to be sharing that. When I first encountered God, oh my goodness, I've never been the same. I'm so thankful for that. So you're mem memorializing that and then you're sharing that with others. Do you remember the difference he made and continues to make in your life? Do you share those things with others? Do you remember who your God is, his nature, his character, his personality? Are you sharing that with others in your conversation? Do you remember that God promised to never leave you or forsake you? How has that played its way out in your life? Do you remember you're really quite annoying and God has to keep reminding you to not forget these things? Yeah. I was going to bring him in this weekend, and I didn't, but I've got… I've got two big letters in my office at home, and it's DB, and they're from our very first sign on our building. When we moved from uh, the Boys and Girls Club, we moved into the Rose Garden Business Center, and we bought our very first sign, and me and one of the pastors were sitting out in the parking lot looking at it at night when it was lit up going, whoa, I can't believe it. We're getting our feet wet. Yeah, but we might drown if these people don't come through with some money on this, okay? And so… <laughs> I mean, seriously, we were like, we were putting our necks out. We were going, okay, God, we believe you've led us here, but you know what? You're going to have to part the waters for us. And, and so that sign was on the building. God blessed us amazingly. We moved to the nightclub that was over off of 17th Avenue and Bell Road. We took that sign and put it over there. And so those letters in my office just remind me of God's faithfulness. He was with us. And then while we were at the nightclub over there, the nightclub doesn't exist anymore. There's actually a QT over there. So anytime I drive by that corner, I always just thank God for what, what went down over there for six years. And I always thank God for the about 200 people that were baptized at pump number seven right there somewhere. <laughs> I think it was about in that location where we had it outside, outside the building. And like 200 people were baptized there. I mean, I memorialized that and then I share it with others. Hey, right here, we, we did church. It was called Sensations. That's crazy. And people that used to get drunk and dance there, they came and got saved. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. When, when I go by Sandra Day O'Connor High School, we were there, out there for nine years. We, we were able to raise a million dollars, and this is the 
building we're sitting in right now that was able to help purchase this and buy this. Are you sharing Christ like that to others? Are you memorializing and sharing with others the great acts of God in your life? Verse 9, and Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan. So he not only set up 12 stones on the outside of the Jordan, this is chapter 4, but in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. And why would he do that? Here it is. Because when the floodwaters came back, you couldn't see it except in a time of drought to remind them that in good times and bad times, God is always faithful. Oh my goodness, I love it. In good times and bad times, never forget the faithfulness of God. God is good in the good times and bad times. Okay, now this is where we're going. We're gonna learn how to put off the old, put on the new, and next weekend we're gonna talk about rolling away the shame. Sometimes we struggle with shame and guilt and condemnation, and we don't know how to get rid of it from the sins we've committed and the sins committed against us. So we're going to talk about that next week, how God brings freedom. Otherwise, you're not going to enter into the fullness of what Christ has for you in the promised land. We're going to talk about that. And then the following week, we're going to talk about how to bring the walls of Jericho down, which are our stubborn negative thoughts and feelings in our head that become instinct and second nature that are, go against the knowledge of Christ in our life. So how do you bring those things down so that we can experience more and more freedom in our lives. I'll be up front at the end of the service along with any available elders and leaders. If you are new, we'd love to meet you. If you need prayer, love to pray with you. And if you have any questions, love to answer those questions for you. Let's, let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, may we now move ahead by faith in you by letting your presence lead us, consecrating ourselves daily so that you can do wonders among us focusing on your greatness and goodness, walking by faith and not by sight, memorializing and sharing with others the great acts that you are doing in and through our lives. We pray these things for our joy, your glory, in your son's beautiful name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Love you guys.